It's easy to be a hypocrite, isn't it? But it's also sometimes hard to notice when we are being hypocritical. I don't know about you, but I often find that the things that bother me most about other people, I realize that the failure I have identified in them is actually a failure and a weakness in my own heart and my own life. Welcome to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths. I'm Steve Hiller, and uh, Jonathan, I think you're right. Uh, for many of us, we may find that the things that annoy us about others are the things that maybe we struggle with ourselves or we get annoyed about because we see that reflected in our own lives. Uh, for the person who uh, maybe finds themselves easily annoyed at, at certain things, they've not actually taken the time to see if that might be a struggle, might be a question worth asking. What are the things that annoy us? What are the things that annoy me? Well, it could well be beneficial. And of course, if we if we pursue that line of thought too far and we listen to the teaching of Jesus, I think probably we will see some of the inconsistency of our own heart. At least speaking personally, some of the things that I I, I noticed first, perhaps with a degree of of of, of annoyance in others, are things, of course, that I'm guilty of myself. So often that's the way. It's a, it's a strange irony. But as we observe that, I think it should move us to repentance to say, actually, you know, my, my heart is not what it should be. I so easily fail in these ways, so easily sin. And that's what Jesus wants us to see. Of course, he wants us to see that if we've been shown grace by God as he's forgiven us the wrong we've done and the wrong we do, we need to be ready to show grace toward one another. And that's that's true only for the Christian, of course. We need to first come to Christ to find forgiveness. Forgiveness is available in him, but it's only for those who, who turn to him in repentance and faith. But if we've done that, then our attitude toward others should be marked by a graciousness and not a quickness to judge. Well, we're going to continue to look at what it means to speak wisely in today's broadcast. So hope you have a Bible and that you'll join us in Matthew chapter 7 as we begin our message. Here is Jonathan. Social media has given each one of us an incredible platform for speaking our mind and for contributing to discussion and to debate. And while that creates wonderful opportunities for interaction and for collaboration on all kinds of levels, it also creates an opportunity for us to do something that we all naturally enjoy, passing judgment on others. The social media world has become for many people and in many contexts a very judgmental place, a place where we feel judged and a place where we are tempted to judge others. And that's no great surprise, of course. It's simply reflecting the realities of our society and of ourselves and our own hearts. There is something deep within the fallen, sinful human heart that enjoys passing judgment on other people. Throughout our series in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew's Gospel, we've seen Jesus tackle head-on a whole range of kind of hot-button issues, lifestyle issues, some of which we would prefer, of course, that he didn't tackle. In the previous passage that we looked at a week ago, Jesus tackled money and the Christian's attitude to money and use of money. And here in our passage this morning, in chapter 7, he turns his attention to the issue of our speech, our words about others and our words to others. He warns us against foolish and against hypocritical speech, and he calls us to wisdom and to discernment in our use of words. Now, that's Jesus' emphasis in these first six verses of chapter 7. But Jesus knows full well that the challenge he lays before us here is more than we can actually manage on our own. Throughout the Sermon on the Mount, he has been calling us to a way of life that is in some ways supernatural, superhuman. It is beyond our own capacity. So in this same passage where he challenges us to speak wisely, he also calls us in verses 7 to 12 to seek help to seek help from our Heavenly Father to live the way that He calls us to live. 
So that's where we're going this morning. That's our little roadmap. Speak wisely and seek help. We begin with this call to speak wisely in verses 1 to 6. And it's a call actually made up of two parts, in fact, two warnings. And the first one is this, in your speech, don't be hypocritical. Don't be hypocritical, says Jesus, verse 1. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. It's so easy to be hypocritical, isn't it? And we're all guilty of it sometimes. A little while ago, The Atlantic ran an amusing little piece on the theme of professional hypocrisy, and it observed the following, I quote, as the cliche goes, people don't always practice what they preach, particularly in some professions. Take the police. When Florida's Sun Sentinel examined the record of 3,915 officers who had traveled on toll roads in 2011, the paper found that nearly 800 of them had traveled at speeds of 90 to 130 miles an hour, many while off duty. Or consider physicians. One study of 500 doctors found that 38% of them were overweight versus 33% of American adults or those in retail. According to the security company Checkpoint Systems, the people who steal most from North American stores aren't shoppers, but employees. It's easy to be a hypocrite, isn't it? But it's also sometimes hard to notice when we are being hypocritical. I don't know about you, but I often find that the things that bother me most about other people, the failures and the blind spots and the sins that I so easily identify in them and am so bothered by in them, when I reflect on those things for any length of time, I realize that the failure I have identified in them is actually a failure and a weakness in my own heart and my own life. So often the faults that we easily identify in others are faults that in fact we ourselves share. I don't know exactly why we do that. Psychologists have their own theories about it. But I think we do it quite often. And here Jesus puts his finger right on it. If we approach our brother or our sister with a judgmental spirit, with a judgmental heart, and we condemn them for their failure, or for their sin, we need to be just a little careful. Because Jesus says that, well, the same standard will be applied to us when we stand before the Lord. If we presume to stand in judgment over against a brother or a sister and condemn them for a fault which actually we share, which can be found in our own lives, well, we can expect the Lord to apply the same standard to us when we stand before him. And of course, that would be a very fearful thing indeed. Jesus drives home the point with a visual aid, and he actually takes the point a little bit further. Not only do we sometimes point out faults in others that we ourselves share, that we ourselves are guilty of, sometimes the fault is actually far bigger and far worse in our own lives than it is in the life of our brother and sister. Verse 3, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and yet pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank in your eye, you hypocrite, says Jesus. It's an illustration that pushes the point to a kind of extreme, but we get the point. A plank in our own eye, a speck in our brother or sister's eye. We go up to a friend at a barbecue and we say, I, I think you've got just a little something there, maybe a crumb from your hamburger bun. And they say, oh yes, thank you. By the way, have you noticed that river of ketchup going down your t-shirt and splattered all over your shorts? It's an embarrassing moment. We see that fault in another, that tiny fault, that speck, and we just pounce. We love that moment. And yet there is an equivalent, but much more significant, much larger fault in our own lives, a plank, and yet we're entirely blind to it. 
I, I think I've noticed over time that it is a mark of spiritual maturity when believers learn to be gracious toward one another in increasing measure, slow to criticize, slow to judge. It, it's often the case that when we're newer in the faith and younger in the faith, we will be quicker to criticize and to judge others, quick to find faults, quick to say we could do it better. But there is a kind of graciousness that goes along with Christian maturity, a slowness to speak, a slowness to find fault, a slowness to judge. The more we go on in our Christian lives, the better we know the Lord and, and His Word, the more we're going to see our own sin and our own failure and the sheer depths of it. And so the more reticent we're going to be to be judgmental toward others. That slowness to speak, that slowness to judge also flows from a deeper and a deepening grasp of the gospel of grace. The truth at the very heart of the Christian message, at the heart of the Christian gospel, is that God in His kindness has rescued us from the judgment that we ourselves deserve because of our rebellion against Him. He has taken the initiative to rescue us, even when we didn't know we needed rescuing, even when we weren't at all inclined to be reconciled to Him, to be made right with Him. He rescued us by giving His only Son to die the death that we deserve, that we might be given life. And we take hold of that salvation by faith. We could never earn it. As the Apostle Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 2 in very familiar verses in verse 8, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. The gospel of grace, when we really understand it, it eliminates boasting. It destroys pride. It cuts down self-righteousness. And the better we know the gospel, the more deeply it has impacted our lives, the less inclined we are going to be to take a judgmental approach to a brother or a sister when they sin and when they fail. We'll be less inclined to do that because we'll know all the better the depths of our own sin and the depths of our own failure. And we'll see all the more the wonder of what God has done for us in His grace and in His kindness. The gospel teaches us that we all approach the Lord on an equal footing as helpless and hopeless sinners in need of a Savior. You're listening to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths and a message called Speaking Wisely. It's part of our series called God's Blueprint for a New Society. I hope that uh, you'll stay with us because we're going to get back to this message in just a moment. If you ever miss a broadcast or you want to go back and listen again, you can always do that by coming to our website. It's EncounterTheTruth.org, EncounterTheTruth.org. All right, back to the message. Here's Jonathan. This connection between grasping the gospel and turning away from judgmentalism, it, it makes sense of the warning of verse 1. Ultimately, in verse 1, I think Jesus is saying that the person who is judgmental in spirit, persistently judgmental in spirit, well, they're going to face judgment because that person hasn't understood grace. They haven't been transformed by grace. They haven't actually been saved by grace themselves. It's worth reminding ourselves how very important it is that we take seriously the command of Jesus in verse 1. It matters not only because we can face judgment if this attitude persists in our lives, it's important because we can make the gospel seem very unappealing if we allow ourselves as a body of believers, as a church family, to be judgmental in spirit. Statistics tell us, and we'll know this, Statistics tell us that huge numbers of people from Christian families abandon the church in their late teens. Apparently, 59% of young people from church backgrounds will abandon the church either permanently or for a very extended period of time after the age of 15. An extended study of this phenomenon by the Barna Group found that 
among a range of factors that contributed toward this trend, a perception of judgmentalism within the church was one factor that drives young people away. Now, doubtless, many of those people who have wandered away will have wandered away simply because they dislike what the Bible says and would prefer to listen to what the culture says on a whole range of issues. And so it's going to, they'll label the church judgmental as an excuse, really. It's not a simple problem, nor is, is it a simple fix. But the observation should give us pause for thought. If there is a judgmental or a hypocritical spirit within a church, it should be little surprise if young people aren't inclined to stay. And so there's an added reason for us, an added motivation to take seriously this call of Jesus in verse 1. In any case, that's the warning here. Don't judge. Don't be judgmental in spirit. Don't be a hypocrite. Now, we could hear that warning, and we could think that Jesus is telling us never to correct a brother or sister, never to call out sin in their lives, never to find fault, never to speak words of any kind of criticism. And some would certainly want to construe the words of Jesus in this passage in that way. Those who would like to avoid any kind of moral constraints that God's Word would place upon them. Those who would call us never to comment on another person's lifestyle choices or, or preferences or behavior. People in that camp would quickly point to chapter 7 and verse 1 and tell us that Jesus forbids us to comment on other people and their lives, forbids us to criticize. And of course, some churches and some whole denominations have gone quite a long way down that road in that line of thinking. In the name of being non-judgmental or, or welcoming or affirming, they've ended up condoning sin and outlawing rebuke. But that kind of reading of the text wouldn't resonate very well with what Jesus goes on to say in verse 5. That's not where Jesus is taking us here. He's not telling us to be undiscerning. He's not instructing us never to correct. He's just telling us to be very careful to avoid hypocrisy. Notice what he says, you hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Jesus isn't saying we should never remove the speck from our brother's eye. He's not saying that we should never address another believer's sin. He's not saying that we should never challenge another believer. He's saying that we need to be careful to avoid hypocrisy, and we mustn't approach a brother or sister with an attitude of moral superiority or of pride. There is, of course, an appropriate way and an appropriate occasion for the believer to address sin in the life of another believer. The Apostle Paul writes in Galatians chapter 6 that if someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore him gently, get involved, be helpful. Don't ignore the issue. In speaking about how the body of believers should address a sexually immoral and unrepentant brother, Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 tells them that they've got to expel the person from the church. And he takes it for granted there in that discussion that believers do have a particular role of judgment when it comes to other believers. Listen to what he writes. What business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not believers to judge those inside? God will judge those outside. But, but as for those within the church... Paul says, expel the wicked man from among you. He goes on actually in the next chapter to address the question of lawsuits among believers, another famous passage. And he makes the very same assumption there in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Believers do have an appropriate role of judgment within the church. He writes, if any of you has a dispute with another, dare he take it before the ungodly for judgment instead of before the saints? Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if you are to judge the world, O people of God, are you not competent to judge trivial cases, cases within the church? Do you not know that we will judge angels? how much more the things of this life. 
You see, there is an appropriate context for believers to exercise judgment within the church. Paul makes that crystal clear. And so, here in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus clearly isn't saying that we should ignore sin in the church, ignore sin in the lives of other believers. But we've got to be careful. And he reminds us that, well, first and foremost, when we see sin in the life of another, it actually provides an opportunity for us to grow personally. It provides an opportunity for each one of us to engage in very careful self-examination. Is that sin, that area of failure that I've observed in another believer's life, is that sin actually present in my own life? And have I got something to deal with personally and first? As I see something ugly in another believer, is that sin evident in me and in my heart? And do I need to repent? And if it is, the very first thing I need to do, my first order of business when I see that sin and I'm aware of it, is to deal with my own personal problem, to deal with my own heart, to repent of my sin. Then I might be in a position to help a brother or sister and to do so with real integrity. Now, as we reflect on the words of Jesus here, and we think through the logic of what he's saying, it all seems perfectly reasonable, perfectly rational. But I think we only really grasp how powerful this instruction is if we pause to imagine what would be the impact on the life of the church if we really took it seriously and really lived it out with consistency. Imagine if each one of us here in this room this morning, when we felt that instinct to criticize and to judge, and we all feel that instinct sometimes, if we paused and first of all examined our own hearts and our own lives to ask if the fault we see in another is actually a fault in our own lives. If we paused to conduct a little heart surgery on ourselves and to deal with that problem, and then perhaps with a new humility and a refreshed grace approach our brother or sister. What a powerful thing that would be. What a transformative thing that would be for the life of the church. Imagine what would be the impact of this church if each one of us resolved with the Lord's help to live like that and to operate like that. So here is a challenge for each one of us to take away this morning. Most of us will, no doubt, have a person whose sin we are aware of, whose fault perhaps is concerning us just now. Another believer who we think needs to repent of something, needs to grow in a particular area, needs to deal with something in their own life. And the odds are that we may well be right in what we notice and what we identify. Maybe we've had it in mind to say something to this brother or sister for quite a long time to help them remove that speck from their eye. But here's the challenge. Whatever faults you see, perhaps a laziness or a, a selfishness or a tendency to gossip or something else altogether, just consider that fault and say, could that fault, could that sin be present in my own life? Could that criticism be directed toward me? And if so, take some time and ask the Lord to deal with you personally, with me personally, before dealing with another. Jonathan Griffiths here on Encounter the Truth, a message called Speaking Wisely. Now, we're pausing right here, but we're going to continue this message next time. If you want to make sure you don't miss it, you can tune in, listen on the radio, or you can always listen through the Encounter the Truth app You'll find that at your favorite app store. And one other way to listen, online at EncounterTheTruth.org. And while you're there, I want to ask you to consider a gift of support because we do depend on your generosity to keep Jonathan's teaching on this station. But as you give a gift of any amount this month, we want to send you a book called Through Gates of Splendor. It's written by Elizabeth Elliott, and it's our way of saying thanks for your support. You can find out more or give online at EncounterTheTruth.org or call us at one 833 99 truth that's 1-833-998-7884 or again the website encounterthetruth.org well thanks for listening today and i hope you'll join us next time